As much as I would like to look at every championship reign in mixed martial arts in a vacuum, where the accomplishments alone are the only deciding factor when it comes to assessing that champion's legacy, unfortunately, that's not at all the reality. Even more so when the champ you took the mantle from acquired legendary status in the sport right before you, and instead of meeting or surpassing them, you fell flat on your face immediately. I'm Tommy from MMA On Point. A special thank you to our awesome Channel Hall of Famers for supporting us, and these are 10 champions that couldn't live up to their legendary predecessor. A quick note before we start, we'll not be including fighters who lost an immediate rematch to the previous champion, as the torch really hadn't been passed on. The champ just lost their grip on it for a moment in a struggle, but regained possession. Got it? Sweet. Let's talk about number 10, Roberto Soldich. Robocop Soldich is in his own right a KSW all-timer. The two-time welterweight champion with two defenses sealed his place as a great in the Polish promotion when he toppled middleweight king and megastar Mamed Kalidov to become a double champ. Without question the biggest name in the entire promotion's history, Kalidov was with KSW from nearly the beginning and the former light heavyweight and two-time middleweight champ, who for a time was considered the best 185 pound fighter in the world outside the UFC, was the promotion's star attraction whether he was fighting for the title or not. So Robocop defeating him and taking a second title was a massive deal, but unlike Kalidov, Soldich had bigger promotions in mind. And while he was a white hot free agent that many assumed would go to the UFC, he would end up in one championship. Now, vacating the middleweight title he just took from Mamed certainly didn't help in surpassing his predecessor's legacy, but he could have followed it up at 185 and one. He did not though. First, he would get need in the junk in his debut and have to call the fight. Herb Dean just called it off. Wow. He can't continue. Which happens, but when you find out that Soldich has always worn a foam cup for some reason instead of one that actually protects you, it kind of feels a little bit more like his fault. So rough debut, but it would be an even rougher sophomore effort as Robocop would be TKO'd in the second round against Sebastian Katastam, a four to one underdog with a pro record of 13 and seven going into the fight. It's over! Wow. Sebastian Katastam! A disastrous run so far for Soldich, and he has not fought since. Number nine, BJ Penn. You need to think very carefully about what you're saying. It's important to clarify that we mean welterweight BJ Penn. Obviously, at lightweight, Penn is one of the division's greatest champions, and he's a legendary fighter in his own right. But his legacy at welterweight is shocking when isolated from the rest of what he was able to accomplish, especially compared to the man he took that title from. Penn crashed into the UFC's lightweight scene like a bat out of hell, but through a far more game than expected Jens Pulver and a draw with Kyle Uno was unable to capture gold in the division. On the final fight of his UFC contract, Penn would be given an opportunity a weight class up to take on God King Matt Hughes, who five defenses in had reached living legend status and was arguably the greatest fighter in the world. Penn was not expected to win. While formidable at lightweight, bumping up to fight the unstoppable Hughes with the skill set he brought to the table just didn't even seem possible. But it was. The underestimated Penn would score a first round rear naked choke and completely flip the sport on its head. It's more so when he left for K1 since his contract was up and was subsequently stripped of the title. Two years later, he would re-up with the UFC though, and things at welterweight would never work out again. First, he lost a title eliminator to GSP, then the rematch for the belt with Hughes. A second bid at Champ St. Pierre would also fall short, and the only other welterweight win that Penn would ever have was when he KO'd Hughes after losing the lightweight title. About that was really the end of Matt's career. The Prodigy is a legend and an all-time great lightweight but at welterweight, his legacy lies in that single upset victory. Number eight, Fabricio Verdum. On the one hand, beating Fedor Emelianenko and ending his decade-long unbeaten streak and dethroning Cain Velasquez are in and of themselves legacy creating. Had Fabricio retired in his post-fight interview after beating Cain, he'd still have a place in the history books. But we're talking about the legacy of that heavyweight title, and up to that point, Velasquez appeared to probably be the best to have ever done it in the UFC. But for the flash KO, he suffered against JDS, Kane was pretty much perfect, and up to the Verdum bout, had won in four heavyweight title bouts and tied the defense record. It just felt like it was going to take something superhuman to beat Cardio Kane, or a city over a mile into the sky. I feel like I was gonna faint. 
You know, that's, that's, that's how exhausted I was. Verdun would best Velasquez in Mexico City after Kane gassed and Fabricio secured a choke during a takedown attempt. It was one hell of a victory, but one that was immediately put into question due to the circumstances. Unfortunately for Verdun, a rematch would fall apart, and he would instead sprint face first into Stipe Miocic in the first three minutes of their fight and get knocked out cold, never to compete for the heavyweight title again. His reign a footnote in the history of that belt. Number seven, John Lennox. It's hard to argue that Bibiano Fernandez isn't the greatest champion that one championship has ever had. He has the most title fight wins with 11, he's been in the most title fights period with 13, and he's tied for the most consecutive title defenses with 7. He has 8 total at bantamweight. The only loss in the promotion he'd ever taken up to the point of his bout with John Lineker was against Kevin Bellignon, a defeat he would avenge. Lineker, the longtime UFC veteran, was cut from the promotion and then days later signed with one. After three bouts, he earned a shot at the Flash, and he would show why his nickname is Hands of Stone. Oh, After dethroning the greatest champion one had ever had, though, things did not turn out well for John, as he would be immediately stripped of his title for missing weight prior to his first defense against Fabricio Andrade, a fight itself that would end with a cup shot and have to be run back. In that fight, Lineker's corner would throw in the towel before the fifth round, thus ending John's one title saga. Viviano's legacy as the promotion's greatest champion still very much intact. Number 6. Carlos Newton Luckily for mentor protege pair Pat Miletic and Matt Hughes, Carlos Newton served as a buffer between their two reigns. Otherwise, things might have gotten a bit awkward. Pat, the founder of Miletic Fighting Systems, was a pioneer in the sport and created the first modern super team of sorts that he was the head of, both at the gym and for a time in the cage as well. The first ever UFC welterweight champion would defend the title four times while his protege worked his way to the top. In his fifth defense, which would have broken the record in the UFC at the time, Militich took on Carlos Newton, who would stun the sport with a sick bulldog choke to snatch the title away from the Militich camp. But their retribution was swift, as Hughes would be Newton's first defense, and he would defeat him to avenge his master. Well, kinda. He passed out from being choked and slammed Carlos, knocking him out. They decided to run it back to make sure, and this time Country Boy Matt left no doubts with a fourth round TKO finish. Hughes would go on to be a living legend champion, and Newton would only win five of his last 13 bouts before retiring. Number five, Luke Rockhold. To take a phrase from a great philosopher, Chris Weidman, you're taking everything I worked for, motherfucker. I want to fight your fucking ass. And in a way, that was the reality of it because when Luke Rockhold entered the UFC at 10 and 1 with two strike force middleweight title defenses, he was very much seen as the truest threat to Anderson Silva's godlike reign over the division. But Luke would be KO'd by TRT Tour in his debut. A loss that was a major setback, but an understandable one given the juiciness of it. Got dick veins at the yeah. side of his neck. He's got more muscle than all of us together. Over the next four fights, Rockhold would prove that he was the guy everyone thought he was, with four incredible performances and finishes on the division's top guys. In the meantime, though, Chris Weidman had done the unthinkable. He'd dethroned Anderson Silva, and then went on to defend that gold three times. He was the new standard at 185, not Luke, already positioned as the second great greatest ever. Defeating Rockhold would further cement Weidman's legacy, but Luke was able to take the crown in an incredible performance that looked like it could be the start of something really, truly special. Then Left Hook Larry jacked his shit and it was all over. Yeah, losing your belt immediately after by way of one of the biggest upsets of all time because you completely dismissed your opponent isn't exactly the greatest way to live up to your predecessor's legacy, especially considering Rockhold would only ever beat David Branch again after that and never see another undisputed title bout. Number four. Cody Garbrandt. If you'd have told me the night this man defeated the greatest bantamweight of all time in Dominic Cruz and took the world title from him, that since that moment he'd go 3-6, and six, I'd have never ever believed you. Because the way Cody Garbrandt looked in that fight was untouchable. Not only that, but he came up so fast. From unranked to champion in a single year, four finishes in his five UFC wins, and then he capped it off with a performance against Cruz that didn't even seem possible. You have to remember that up to that point, only two things had ever stopped Dom Cruz, Uriah Faber nine years earlier, and injuries. That was it. This guy had five career bantamweight WEC and UFC title defenses. He'd beat Faber, Joseph Benavidez, TJ Dillashaw, Demetrius Johnson. A healthy Cruz was unbeatable until Garbrandt took that man to church for five rounds. If nobody could beat Dom, who could possibly beat Cody? The answer to that question is TJ Dillashaw, and Pedro Munoz, and Rob Font, and Kai 
Icara Franz and Davis and Figueredo. Look, it hurts to talk about all of it, okay? But yeah, those back-to-back -back title losses to Dillashaw, followed by another KO finish in a fight with Munoz, really just almost completely erased what happened before it, and certainly did not end up matching the legendary reign of his predecessor. Well, you said that again. Yeah. Number three, Holly Holm. I've often said when discussing Holly Holm that you can never take that moment away from her when she defeated Ronda Rousey. And I say that because of everything that's happened since then. You don't need me to sell you on Ronda's legacy here. Still the most important women's champion in the history of the sport. She's a groundbreaker, seven straight title defenses, eight if you include Strike Force, biggest women's star ever. Holly Holm knocking her out was talked about by presidents and celebrities. So there was going to be a lot to live up to for Holly Holm. While everyone assumed a rematch match was next, the timetable for Rousey's return wasn't clear, and Holly didn't want to wait, so her first defense would be against Ronda's rival, Misha Tate. And it's all over! Misha, Misha, Misha Tate hits the new champion! It was a shocking come-from-behind victory that would see Holm lose the title without a single successful defense. In the years since, Holly has fought the very best of the division and the best at 145 as well. Unfortunately, though, she's come up short in all of those top-level bouts, with three more opportunities at gold that she was unable to realize. It's certainly not what everyone expected after toppling the sport's most dominant champion, and why that moment is the defining one in Holly's legacy. Number two, Johnny Hendricks. All right, in this house, we acknowledge that Johnny Hendricks beat George St. Pierre, and that is final. <laughs> I'm right. But of course, this house means nothing, and in reality, the only three people that matter decided that GSP was the winner. But with the legendary welterweight champions leave of absence immediately thereafter, it really felt like Hendricks was the guy. Because for the first time during his epic second reign as champion, it seemed like St. Pierre had been bested. So all eyes were on Johnny as he entered that vacant title bout with the resurgent Robbie Lawler. And Johnny Boy delivered. In an epic bout worthy of the absence of the division's greatest champion, Hendricks took the title and was ready to carry the mantle until St. Pierre returned, if he ever intended to. But sadly, we all know how this story would end. After losing another heartbreaking and very close decision that many felt he deserved in the rematch with Lawler, Johnny's career would dive off a mountain, losing five of his next seven, not even looking like the same person anymore, and eventually retiring after a brutal loss to Paulo Costa. This sport is fast and nasty. Number one, Josh Barnett. Pretty hard to surpass the legacy of your predecessor when they snap the belt from you in disgrace right after you do it. Even all the way back in 2002, Randy Couture had already cemented his legacy as an all-time great. He was the UFC 13 tournament winner, the two-time heavyweight champion, and had two defenses of the title under his belt against the formidable Pedro Hizo. Only Stipe Miocic a million years later would manage to get three defenses in a row. And so beating him, being his first loss in the UFC, and taking that title was a big deal. And at 13-1, the 24-year-old babyface Assassin was primed to be the next big thing in the sport. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a new champion. It is over! The new champion! I told you the guys. Baby faced assassin! It seemed like the perfect passing of the torch, a heavyweight champion for a new generation of mixed martial arts. But his reign would last all of a few months, and that was only because of the slow nature of bureaucracy. Barnett failed his post-fight test for PEDs, something that happened the fight previous as well, where he was let off with a warning because this was the early 2000s, but fool me twice, shame on me! And so Josh was stripped of his title. As a result, Barnett would leave the promotion and the United States to head to Japan, forever chasing the the best heavyweights but never quite reaching the top. He'd return to the UFC 11 years later, but never fought again for a title and never got the chance to redeem his championship legacy in the promotion. You know who's never failed a single PED test, to my knowledge? The editor of this video, Max Randall. He kicked this video's ass too, so go follow him on his socials and check out his very cool YouTube channel. A massive thank you to our channel Hall of Famers. You guys have far surpassed my legacy in the sport with your greatness. Fight fans, if you hit the join button, you can become a Hall of Famer 2 and get exclusive content like our weekly live streamed writers meetings. Like and subscribe so Robocop will start wearing a real cup. Leave a comment down below about any other champions who fumbled the belt's legacy after an all-time great. And thank you so much for watching. I'll see you on the beach.